Welcome, fantastic friends and fans, to the Fancast at Four podcast. My name is Dan Bettenhausen, and I will be your host as we venture into the what ifs of Marvel's first family, who will soon be appearing in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. With Spider Man director John Watts set to direct the Fantastic Four, rumors and speculation are flying around as to who will be playing the comic book royalty. But what if a different director was behind the camera? That is what we hope to explore in this podcast. Now, here is how the show works. Each episode will focus on one director who has never helmed an MCU film. Myself and a special guest will then fan cast a Fantastic Four film based on actors and actresses who the director has worked with previously and who have also not been cast in a major MCU role. We will each be casting a Reed Richards, AKA Mr. Fantastic, Sue Storm, AKA Invisible Woman, Johnny Storm, AKA The Human Torch, Ben Grimm, AKA The Thing, and their nemesis, Victor Von Doom, AKA Dr. Doom. After comparing lists, we will then give a pitch as to what that film may look like. To allow for a little more creativity, the film pitch does not need to be part of the MCU. Now, let's meet this episode's guest. I'm very excited this week to introduce my friend and podcast producer, Pat Bolfamonte, who in internet circles also goes by the nickname Monty. He is creator of the Montyverse channel on YouTube, and he is one of the most knowledgeable people I know when it comes to comic books, especially Marvel and DC. Welcome, Pat. Oh, hey, Dan. That was quite the intro there, buddy. <laughs> oh, I try. <laughs> wow. I treat my guests well here. I hope I live up to all of that. Hey, <laughs> how, how are you? Oh, I'm good. Thank you. I'm super excited. Um, when you came to me with this idea, I thought it was fantastic. No pun intended, but yes, the pun <laughs> was intended. Um, but... Yeah, I think this is this is a great idea. I'm excited to be on the first show. I'm excited to talk about a comic book property that hasn't gotten as much love as I think they deserve, the Fantastic Four. Yeah, yeah. We've had three, I'd say, mainstream films so far, and I don't think any of them are particularly that good. Um, some of them have, the first two maybe have a little bit of that campy factor, but I don't like talking about that uh most recent one yeah i mean the meme is real the best fantastic four movie we've gotten so far is the incredible because <laughs> all of these movies seem to just miss what makes the fantastic four special um before diving into who this director is that we're going to be focusing on this week i was hoping you as uh the aforementionedly claimed uh expert on all things marvel and dc could maybe give us a little breakdown on who the fantastic four are i would be happy to dan thanks the Fantastic Four was created in 1961 by comic book legends Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and have been one of Marvel Comics' most popular properties since. In that issue, super genius Reed Richards was exposed to high levels of cosmic radiation along with his best friend Ben Grimm, his then-girlfriend Sue Storm, and her younger brother Johnny Storm during a trip to space in the stolen rocket The Marvel One. The radiation mutated him and his friends, and together they became the Fantastic Four, a team of adventurers who explored space, time, and alternate dimensions, and saved the world along the way from science-based threats. For a breakdown of each member, I'll start with Dr. Reed Richards himself, aka Mr. Fantastic, a brilliant scientist and inventor who has been considered the smartest man on Earth in the Marvel Universe. He is a polymath with mastery of all sciences, including electrical, mechanical, and aerospace engineering, electronics, chemistry, physics, and biology, just to name a few. Reed is intelligent, calm, and at times detached due to his high-functioning mind, and this sometimes causes conflict amongst his team. But there is no doubt that while Reed is sometimes in his own head too much, he loves his fantastic family more than anything. Dr. Susan Sue Storm, aka the Invisible Woman, was a college student when she was bombarded with cosmic radiation and given the powers of invisibility and force fields. While she was originally known as the Invisible Girl, she is most famously known by her more mature name, the Invisible Woman. Sue is very much the mother figure of the Fantastic Four, as she is front and center in the lives of each member of the team, displaying her overprotectiveness and compassion. Sue later marries Reed and has two children with him, Franklin and Valeria Richards. While being a great mother, wife, and friend, Sue is still highly intelligent and is the strongest member of the team by a large margin. Johnny Storm, aka the Human Torch, is Sue's hot-headed younger brother who was in high school at the time of the Marvel 1 incident, and after the crash he gained the ability to engulf his body in flames. 
the power to absorb fire harmlessly into his body, as well as control any nearby fire by the sheer force of his will. He can also fly, and he shouts, Flame on, which has become a catchphrase of his. Being the youngest member of the group, Johnny is snarky, brash, and impetuous, which makes him butt heads with the senior members of the group quite often. Despite all of his flaws, Johnny is fiercely loyal and will do anything to help the people he cares about. Benjamin Ben Grimm, aka The Thing, was a pilot hailing from Yancey Street on the Lower East Side of Manhattan when he was asked by his best friend Reed to pilot the Marvel 1 spaceship. After the crash, Ben was transformed into a super strong rock monster, unable to return to the Ben Grimm he once was. Ben hated his new look and considered himself to be a hideous monster. These feelings causing some animosity between him and his best friend Reed, who tried everything to turn Ben back. While Ben Grimm may have a tough exterior, deep down he is very sensitive and caring. Over time, he embraces his look and his new life, becoming the beating heart of the Fantastic Four, who Ben views as his surrogate family. Yeah, they, they, they start out as a team of adventurers, but the thing that really makes them special is they evolve into a family. These people really know each other, and they, they develop that familiar relationship and evolve as characters as the years go on. So, um, one question. I think even the most casual of uh, film or comic book fans know that the Fantastic Four's main nemesis is Victor Von Doom or Dr. Doom. Can you tell me how he plays into all of this? Oh, of course. Um, in the most soap operatic fashion possible, uh, Victor Von Doom was college roommates with Reed Richards. And after uh, an, a science experiment gone wrong, he is horribly disfigured. And he blames Reed Richard for this and has and starts a lifelong vendetta against Mr. Fantastic. Uh, over, th over the course of his life, he learns magic and alchemy and builds a suit of armor and becomes the king of Latveria, which, you know, most people as one do. Does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah as, one, as one does. And Total, Totally how I would want to, you know, exact vengeance on my uh, roommate, you know. Yeah, and uses all of the knowledge, power, and wealth he's accumulated to just constantly mess with Reed Richards. Um, are there, I mean, without going into too much detail, who are maybe some of the other uh, main antagonists that the Fantastic Four face? Oh, there's so many, and 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 one of the perks of being a Stanley Jack Kirby creation is there. There's a lot of fantastically weird uh, opposition that they face, including the Mole Man, who lives underground and <laughs> controls an army of mole people. Uh, you have famously Galactus and his heralds, uh, one of which is the Silver Surfer, Norrin Rad. You have Annihilus and the Annihilation Wave, uh, which reside in the negative zone, which is a uh, which is an alternate dimension. You have just so many weird and wonderful villains. You have the Wizard, you have just a cavalcade of colorful opposition for the Fantastic Four to face. Awesome. Thank you very much for that brief history lesson on the Fantastic Four. Uh, but now, uh, I really want to talk about the director we're going to be focusing on uh, this week. Um, I'd like to think that for this inaugural episode, we picked a director um, who's pretty well known. Uh, he has some of the most recognizable blockbusters in Hollywood history. Uh, to date, he has 35 director credits to his name. He's been nominated seven times for Best Director, and he's won twice uh, for the film Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan. This week, we will be focusing on Steven Spielberg. Pat, what do you think of when you think of Steven Spielberg? The first word that comes to mind is just iconic. When you think directors, you, th you immediately jump to one of a handful, and one of those is definitely Spielberg. But all another thing that jumps to mind is big swings, you know, adventure. Uh, he creates these vast kind of uh, very interesting and very different types of movies over the course of his career. Um, but I think when I think Spielberg, I, I, I kind of think of his more adventure-based movies, his more action-based movies. Uh, those really stuck out to me. Yeah, no, I'm right there with you. I think the thing that comes to mind is groundbreaking. Um, he, I think, by all um, by all standards, kind of created the blockbuster. When he, when we first saw Jaws in 1975, well, I didn't see it in 1975. I was not born I hope yet. Not. But when, the, when the world saw Jaws in 1975, I mean, it was just it was the invention of the blockbuster. And then we get things like uh, Indiana Jones, E.T. I mean. 
the list goes on and on. Uh, Saving Private Ryan, again, as we mentioned. And now he's even going to be nominated, presumably again, for West Side Story. And that'll be the first film in Oscar history to win twice. A set. Uh, the same movie is going to win twice, or the same story is going to win twice at the Oscars. Now, before we turn to what everyone's been waiting for, our, our cast list, I do want to do a segment that I'm going to call Four Fantastic Films. So each week or each episode, I want each myself and a guest to break down our four favorite films from the director we're discussing. So with that in mind, Pat, what are your four favorite Steven Spielberg films? Oh, wow. That is a, that is a great question. Thanks for asking, Dan. Um, You're welcome. I, I personally, when I think of Spielberg, uh, four films really jump out very quickly to me. Those fours being uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, I love adventure films. I think it's one of the most fun adventure swashbuckling movies uh, that has ever been made. Indiana Jones as a character is fantastic, and Harrison Ford is fantastic in that movie. Um, I love it, and it's a movie that I go back to a bunch. Um, another one that sticks out to me very much so is I remember watching Schindler's List when I was in school, when I was younger, in history class, and that movie stuck with me. It's it's such a fantastically directed written and acted movie um to this day i just i have a lot of love for it and i think it's one of spielberg's truly best films uh then of course there's the iconic jurassic park which holds up even to this day i think it's a master class in how to film and direct a uh, a blockbuster movie uh super great and one definitely one of my all-time favorite films in general and then of course um minority report i i remember watching this and and something about it stuck with me i just really love the big swings that it takes i love the world building i love all the visuals uh and i just think that out of his filmography it's one that i find myself constantly revisiting um more than the other ones so i think over time that's definitely snuck into one of my favorite spielberg films awesome that is a great list I think for me, we have some, a little bit of crossover. Um, Jurassic Park is certainly one of my top four St Spielberg films. Um, just the the visuals, how those dinosaurs came to life, still hold up to me to this day. Um, and while I'm not a big fan of jump scares and whatnot, like the raptor scene in the kitchen is still very memorable. And the T-Rex chase, all of it is just so mesmerizing. And um, it's one I can go back and watch over and over again. I do have an Indiana Jones film on my list, but it's not Raiders. It's actually The Last Crusade. Of course. Um, I think the dynamic between Ford and Sean Connery is just classic. Um, and I love the story. I love the adventure they go on. I love the father-son dynamic and just all they go through, the end with the, the Holy Grail, just start to finish. I think it is just a, both a well-told adventure story and if well-told family story next on my list is honestly maybe a little more maligned film on steven spielberg's filmography the terminal uh, i felt like i needed to get tom hanks on this list i know it's not a favorite of a lot of people but i think it's such an interesting and i'd even say different film than steven spielberg's done well very much contained in this airport terminal you do have tom hanks giving Kind of a strange uh, Eastern European accent there, but I think it's just a sweet, sweet movie um, and one that I really enjoy returning to from time to time. And finally, I'd say my last or my fourth favorite, not necessarily in this order, my fourth favorite Steven Spielberg film is Lincoln, very much carried by Daniel Day-Lewis as Abraham Lincoln. I think this is such a great film that shows a snippet of time where they're trying to get this amendment passed to abolish uh, slavery. And it is just such a wonderful movie. And again, carried ve very heavily by the lead actor. But I think Spielberg kind of returns to form here um, after, after a few movies that maybe aren't so loved uh, between War Horse, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. This was definitely, to me, a return to form to, for Steven Spielberg and then leads to some pretty solid films after that. Yeah, I like the part of Lincoln when when it was, when it they find out that there were aliens at the end. 
<laughs> that was well, uh, I think I think you got that mixed up. Oh, but... sorry, sorry. I must be thinking of another movie. <laughs> but I mean, wouldn't that have been something? Oh, uh, what John Wilkes Booth wasn't actually the assassin; he was an alien. It was yes. aliens that assassinated Abraham Lincoln. Boom. You're welcome, Spielberg. Man. Give you a simple idea, simple idea. <laughs> I mean, what's what's stranger that or Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter? Um, Abraham Lincoln Crystal Skull Alien Hunter would be. There weird. you go. <laughs> That's the answer. Well, we had some great lists there, uh, but now I think it's time to dive into what everyone's been waiting for in a segment I like to call the Fancastic Casting. Oh, uh, I'm ready. As a, remi- as a reminder, um, we will be going back and forth, each casting um, five characters in the Fantastic Four film that we are pitching, um, and some stipulations. These actors can't be uh in a major mcu role already if they're in a minor one kind of like uh Gemma chan was that is fine they also have had to work previously with steven spielberg so those are really the only rules we have um otherwise be as creative as you want any questions pat no i, th- I think um <laughs> you laid it out pretty clear for us with that in mind let's start off with mr fantastic himself reed richards pat who is your Mr. Fantastic? I think I got a good one. And my Mr. Fantastic is Brian Cranston, who had a minor role in the film Saving Private Ryan. Interesting choice. I'm I, ready to hear more. I, uh, I think that he embodies this... Extre- I think that he could portray the extremely scientific side of Reed while also shining through those familial uh, bonds with characters like... Sue and Johnny and Ben and his children who I'm incorporating into my film. Uh, and I think that a character a character actor like Brian Cranston who can bring to life, who can balance the light and dark in a character will work extremely well for the read I want in my film. Because I have a very specific vision for my Reed Richards and I think Brian Cranston is going to be the one to bring my idea into fruition with his extremely talented range. Uh, I loved him as Hal in Malcolm in the Middle. I think that he was a very good patriarch. Uh, kind of goofy, kind of dumb at times. But then we get a very different patriarch in the Walter White character on Breaking Bad. Um, and I think the movies he's done after those two roles have really showed that he's got a lot more to give as an actor. And I think this is going to be potentially the role of his career if this movie existed and wasn't something I made up just for this podcast. <laughs> Interesting choice, and with without spoiling your pitch yet, Brian Cranston is, I'll say, a little bit older of an actor, um, so I'm interested to see how that plays out um, in your pitch and how what the rest of the cast looks like. Um, but before we dive into the rest of Monty's picks, uh, I need to share my Mr. Fantastic. Um, I did go younger than Brian Cranston. I mean, um, but I hope still... you didn't go older. <laughs> there's, there's not much room left. <laughs> um, but I still went with an actor in his 40s, um, but I went with an actor who was uh, featured in Lincoln, and my Mr. Fantastic is George- Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Um, Great choice. I think... Choice. Thank you. Thank you. I think he has kind of this very calm, cool demeanor um, in a lot of his roles, I see him very similarly to the character we get in like Inception. Um, and it's kind of, so that kind of Mr. Fantastic, a very focused, hyper-focused Mr. Fantastic. Um, he still has the ability to be a kind, gentle father, but when he puts his mind to something, um, really goes all out and even can be a little, um, what's the word? Neglectful about anything else that's going on. And I think that's something that Joseph Gordon-Levitt could portray very well. Um, Absolutely. I, I uh, He's one of my favorite actors. I think that he's not doing enough. I think give him way more to do in, in movies and TV. I, I love him and everything that he does. Uh, great choice all around. I, I, I really enjoy it. He's someone I'm a little surprised hasn't been in an MCU film already, even in a smaller role, a smaller, smaller maybe side character role. So um, definitely want to get him featured to your point that he needs to be working more because yeah. he's a great actor. Um, so 
hopefully, uh, listeners, you've liked our first two picks for Mr. Fantastic. Uh, but now I want to turn to the matriarch of the Fantastic Four, Sue Storm, a.k.a. Invisible Woman. Pat, who's your Sue Storm? My Sue Storm, I think, is great. My Sue Storm is the awesome Laura Dern. Oh, yes. I think that, that. I, I, as if my Reed Richards pick didn't give it away, my Fantastic Four is going to be a little bit on the older side. Not to say that Laura Dern is elderly, but they're, they're all well-established uh, in their careers and life at this point in, this, in their story. And I think Laura Dern has this presence that is that can portray Sue extremely well because Sue is very much the eternal mother figure of the Fantastic Four but at the same time she is such a, a powerful character beyond our wildest imagination I think Laura can really shine a light on that power that we haven't seen from Sue in other films while still being a very loving and compassionate wife sister mother friend uh, that Sue is. Any anything in her filmography that you see taking influence in her Sue Storm? Any any movies that come to mind that she's been in? Well, obviously, like she plays a very good intellectual character in Jurassic Park, so that yeah. jumps out to me right away. Her her turn in the Last Jedi has kind of showed me that she's very open to being part of these big franchise films, um, and she could play someone in a leadership role, uh, someone who's very you know, very much in charge and can take command of a situation and a room. So so those two jump out to me right away. That is a great choice. I love that choice. I mean, I think in most of her film, she, or films and filmography, she's a very capable character. Um, and I think that's what you need in a Sue Storm. Uh, so... No, I, I love that choice. Um, no, I don't... I, I'm speechless as to it because I'm like... I'm just picturing now all the possibilities of Laura Dern as uh, a Sue Storm. So, no, fantastic choice. Um, yeah, we, we need a fantastic counter. <laughs> I, we, yeah, we do need a counter or a buzzer every time we say fantastic uh, that doesn't proceed four. Yeah. Uh, but now my choice. Um, again, staying younger, um, I'm going with uh, an actress who... Um, I think it's starting to break out a little more. She's been in a lot of side characters, been in a little more uh, comedic roles, uh, at least early on in her career. I think some standout, though, was in the Netflix show Glow. Uh, my Sue Storm is Alison Brie, who is in St Steven Spielberg's The Post. Um, I think you see Alison, again, as very comedic, and I don't see her playing jokey or comic uh, as any sort of comic relief in this film but she can be witty and I think Sue Storm still has that wit to kind of snap back at Reed when he's being ridiculous um, you also see her being very brainy like in her community despite being a comedy she's a very smart and capable character in community just I've been I've been rewatching yeah. the Scream films and even in Scream 4 she she turns it around and plays a completely conniving and very right. selfish character in that movie so it shows you that she's just not here to make jokes even though a lot of people she's got really, she's got yeah. range she's got range and I think put in front and center in this big action property she could really rise to the occasion and i think opposite of a joseph gordon levitt they would have great chemistry really shine and um, bounce off each other very well um i think allison brie would be a standout and deserves to finally have that kind of big franchise property uh under her belt and i think she'd do a great job i love it great outside the box choice i think that was thank great. you Thank you. And I will admit, casting a Sue Storm based on Steven Spielberg was very difficult. I struggled because uh, I either had to go very young, which I wasn't hoping to do with my pitch, um, or kind of in your case, on the older end, and I didn't want to do that either. So once I came upon her and going through the post-cast list, um, the light bulb just kind of uh, lightened up. Yeah, I think I think that, I think think that it works out. I think with, with a younger cast, I think... She is very capable of filling the shoes of a Sue Storm. I think you you look at her and you see the strength and vulnerability of a character like Sue. Uh, so yeah. I, I love it. I dig it. I appreciate that, and I'm glad you do. Now, going to the uh, spitfire, pun intended, uh, of the Fantastic Four, uh, Johnny Storm, younger brother of Sue Storm. Pat, 
who has who have you fan cast as Johnny Storm? Flame on uh, Johnny Storm. Believe it or not, is my favorite member of the Fantastic Four. I, no, I, I have I would a lot. Not have guessed. I would never have guessed. I feel like me and Johnny are kindred spirits. But there is when I was looking through Spielberg's filmography, and I happened to notice this actor was in a, one of his movies. A, a light bulb just kind of went off because this person has done has been some of my favorite characters in the area of science fiction and i think that he is he it, it still shocks me this day that he's not in a major franchise superhero movie yet and that actor is nathan fillion who had a part in steven spielberg's saving private ryan and i think oh, did he? That, yes and i think that he would make an absolutely fantastic and I did that on purpose, Johnny Storm, <laughs> especially one that's a little older in age and a little bit more advanced in his career. Just because when you think of Nathan Fillion, you kind of see that smarmy, snarky personality and you kind of think of this like, uh, you think of Mal Reynolds, the kind of ship captain that he played and you think of like all of these characters. And personally, I would have loved to see him as Hal Jordan in Green Lantern. Yeah. So that kind of influenced it. For this uh, kind of influenced my decision as well. But yeah, I think that he would be an extremely great Johnny for my story. That is fascinating choice. Um, I think one thing when I think of Nathan Fillion is charisma. Yes. I mean, he has charisma that goes on for miles and miles. And I think he would be kind of, kind of inferring from what you're going with with your choices so far. I think he would fit great as Johnny Storm. Um, one thing that I'm still trying to get out of my head, though, is like he's been fan cast heavily as Wonder Man in uh, the MCU, if, if and when that ever he ever gets introduced. So to see him not go that route and potentially be a Johnny Storm is really interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, I just have to give a shout out to James Gunn for cutting that scene in Guardians of the Galaxy 2 <laughs> where he's on the posters as Wonder Man, so I could include him in this fan cast. So thanks, James Gunn. Appreciate it. Hey, to be fair, we said he that's not a major role yet. So. I know, I know. <laughs> but I, I, wanted, I wanted fresh. I wanted fresh from the ground up. No, I like it. I like it. For my Johnny Storm... Uh, or the Human Torch. Uh, I went with an actor who was featured in Spielberg's most recent film, West Side Story, um, a relative newcomer. He played the character uh, Riff in West Side Story, and that is Mike Faced. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. But um, I don't know. To, I know the I know the actor <laughs> you speak of. I do not know the pronunciation. I wish um, I could help. And, and really. All I'm basing it on is his performance in West Side Story. If you have not seen it, it is a top 10 film of 2021 for me. Again, as I mentioned previously, very well could be a front runner for Best Picture um, in this next Oscar. And I think a lot of that is him. He is one of my favorite parts of the film. He is, he is gruff. He has charisma. He is smarmy. He just checks all the boxes. Uh, I don't expect the Human Torch to dance and sing in this film that Never I'm going to be pitching. Never know. I mean, I might throw a curveball. Did, oh, did but... Yoan Grifford, Gr Grufford expect <laughs> to dance in Rise of the Silver Surfer? That's fair. That is fair. Uh, but really, if you go see West Side Story I, and you look for Johnny Storm in Mike Faced, you will see it. Um, I don't know what more I can really say on it because, again, I'm very heavily basing it on one performance and a performance you all should really see. But I see Mike Faced also being a great sibling and play off of Alison Brie um, as a brother-sister dynamic as well. So that is my Johnny Storm, Mike Faced uh, from West Side Story. Yeah, Mike Faced, I, I do know him. Uh, I've never, I haven't seen West Side Story yet, but he has made a name for himself on Broadway. He was the original Connor Murphy uh, in Dear Evan Hansen on Broadway, and he was absolutely fantastic. I do think you have something there, and I love it. I love casting unknowns in superhero roles because I think they have a lot of room to surprise people. So, great choice. I, I think you do need some, some relative newcomers. Again, he came on the scene pretty fast recently, but um, I think to the general fan base, he's still going to be a relative unknown. So um, that was something I was hoping to get in this film that I'm going to be pitching. Um, and yeah, I'm that Broadway connection is fantastic as well. So thank you very much for that uh, little bit of context too, Pat. The last member of the Fantastic Four, but certainly not least, my personal favorite uh, member of the superhero team is Ben Grimm, 
also known as The Thing. Um, Pat, I'm curious, who is your Ben Grimm? This role, in all honesty, this role for me was the hardest to cast because I have a very big soft spot for Ben Grimm. I think there's a lot of things that an actor needs in order to play Ben Grimm. Um, and there wasn't a lot of that in Steven Spielberg's kind of film catalogs because I was looking for a lot of specifics. But I think I found someone who could check most of the boxes. And that someone from the movie The Post is Bob Odenkirk. I think that he has, he has not to steal your thunder or your word, but he has a lot of charisma and he has a lot of heart and he has a way of endearing himself to audiences. And I think that that heart is what makes the character of Ben Grimm such an integral part of the Fantastic Four. He's the glue that keeps them together. He's kind of that driving force. And I think that for an older cast, I think Bob Odenkirk has the ability to kind of portray the tough but lovable Ben Grimm that I'm looking for in my movie. That kind of strong supportive uncle figure in everyone's life that, that they have. Interesting. For those listening, I know you, you can't see it, but like when he first said Bob Odenkirk is Ben Grimm the thing, my eyebrows raised. I kind of leaned back in my chair like, what are you talking about? But the more I thought about it and the more he was going on, I'm like, that's inspired casting. And then I think back to like his most recent film, Nobody, where he was an action star, which was never something I expected. Like he could be he could be Ben Grimm. And I think one thing that's very integral to the Ben Grimm character is um, kind of this deep sadness within him that he kind of tries to hide um, and is probably a little bit of an allegory for his powers, the, this rock creature. And I think uh, especially when you watch something like Better Call Saul, um, he has this kind of deep sadness in him that he tries to mask. And I think that's something Bob Odenkirk really could display well um, as a Ben Grimm. Yes, exactly. That that's exactly what I'm going for. I use the word endearing, but you kind of you kind of said what I had thought when I originally uh envisioned him as the thing. And that is that yeah, Ben, ben is is this very tr internally conflicted, troubled character, but still puts on this uh facade of of strength and 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 bravery for for his friends. Um and I think I really think that Bob can give us all of that while showing us a Ben that has evolved more and has accepted kind of the the circumstances for for which he lives his life. So yeah, that 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 was my choice. The more I think about it, the more I love it. Um, I think, it's, and, I think it's I'm, I'm and I'm excited. I know we still have one character left, but I'm excited to see how this all comes together in your pitch. Um, for my Ben Grimm. Um, I think I also went a little outside of the box and I also probably cheated a little bit. Uh, this actor is actually hasn't been in a released Steven Spielberg film yet, but he's going to be in Spielberg's upcoming film, which is, I believe, an autobiographical or uh, an autobiographical film called The Fablemans. Um, and that actor is Seth Rogen. Listen, I will not dock any points for this mainly because you're in control and you make up all the rules, but I will accept it. <laughs> um, one thing that I really wanted to try and do was uh, have an actor who is Jewish, which Seth Rogen famously is. Um, and again, one thing that I kept kind of getting drawn to was uh, having cast Joseph Gordon-Levitt as Reed Richards. I kept going back to the film, the two of them, um, were featured in 5050, where they were best friends. Joseph Gordon Levitt's character is diagnosed with uh, cancer, and Seth Rogen is there to help kind of support him. And I think I see that dynamic being recreated as, but rather than as friends dealing with this, it's friends dealing with these new powers they get. Um, and I think Seth Rogen can really add to the voice of Ben Grimm because he's going to either be CGI'd up or some sort of. Uh, cosmetic change so you're not going to be really seeing Seth Rogen too much as Seth Rogen uh, so you're not going to be looking at this no offense Seth Rogen kind of goofy looking character you're going to be hearing the voice more and I really do think he could pull off the it's clobbering time and all of the other kind of key phrases that Ben Grimm could pull off 
Um, and still, even more and more, he is starting to get in some more serious roles. And though this is still a superhero movie, it is very much a family film as well. And I think he would be a great Ben Grimm in this movie I'm hoping to put together. I absolutely love it. It, it When you said it, I had trouble wrapping my head around it because I have I've have heard it before and I've and I've always had trouble processing it before. But it's these castings that these comic book movies do, like very much in the vein of Heath Ledger as the Joker or Michael Keaton as Batman, mm -hmm. where they take these actors that you don't envision in a certain role, and they give them the opportunity to actually act and to perform and bring a character to life. And I think that this is something that Seth Rogen needs. Um, as an actor, if he really wants to seriously come out swinging, just a character that he can be kind of funny and quirky with, but he really has to be strong um, and serious at times to really get this character to be a living, breathing person. And I'm very yeah. excited to see him in this role if they do cast him, Marvel. <laughs> we'll see. Um, if he does end up being in the John Watts film, I feel like I should go to Hollywood and, uh, you know, get a job. But... Feige, I'll take a ticket too, <laughs> okay? I want to come. Well, so we've gotten through the main hero cast, but what's a hero team without a villain? And with that, Pat, I want to hear who you'd cast as Victor Von Doom. I mean... Or Dr. Doom. When you first told me we were doing Spielberg, this is the first casting choice I've made. Because I want to see this actor, I don't think he'd ever do one, but I would love to see this actor do a comic book movie. And I think we real we need a very threatening and menacing, serious Doctor Doom. And the person that I think could bring that to life in my movie is from Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln himself, Daniel Day-Lewis. I think that we need someone, because my movie is going to feature a lot of, not to spoil anything, but it's going to feature a lot of the out there aspects of the Fantastic Four. And we need someone to play everything straight and serious and still be extremely menacing at the same time. And you need someone that you could see as opposition to Reed Richards. And I think that Daniel Day-Lewis playing a very method Doctor Doom would absolutely nail all of those things. But he'll play King of Latveria, Master of Alchemy, Doctor Doom, better than any human being on this planet. And that's something that I really want for my movie. So I, I really think the Master of Craft, uh, God of Acting, Daniel Day-Lewis, would be perfect for my Doctor Doom. I thought I was speechless before, but just envisioning the actor of actors, Daniel Day-Lewis, in a Marvel film, uh, much less as Doctor Doom, one of the most famous and menacing villains in Marvel history. I mean, I don't know if I need to comment much more. Like, I'm sold. If and, this ever and, happened... And like, here's the kick. Please. He's not taking the mask off. He's ha he's wearing the metal mask the entire film. I mean, he could pull it off. Like, he... I mean, you say that, though. Okay, we're talking about Daniel Day-Lewis here. He would wear the mask yes. for years... <laughs> Outside of filming, like yes. he he would get so into it. You, he, I mean, oh man, I want this to happen. He's allegedly retired, so I don't know if we would ever get this. And I say that a little facetiously, but Kevin Foggy, call us. I would I would buy the ticket as soon as I could if we got Daniel Day Lewis in a Marvel movie, much less as Doctor Doom. So yeah, I'm sold. I'm sold on that. No, great choice, Thank fantastic you, sir. choice. Thank you, uh, sir. For mine, um, I think we have what could certainly be an actor that could reach Daniel Day-Lewis caliber one day. Um, some people may think he's already there, but for uh, my Doctor Doom, I have an actor who's played a villain very recently, um, who's probably one of the biggest names right now in Hollywood, uh, also featured in the movie Lincoln. My Doctor Doom would be none other than Adam Driver. Um <sighs> I think with Soul. this, really, you would get a lot of Kylo Ren in here, but less whiny, <laughs> to be yeah. to be quite frank yeah. with you. Um, I th I think without stepping on on you, but yeah, you're I, fine. No, you're but fine. As soon as you said it, I just I see this is the evolution of his. Like Doom is a way for him to show all that he's learned over the past 
years of playing Kylo Ren and kind of doing a master class on it. Like the Doom Doom is an evolved version of Kylo Ren. He is he's yeah. very much that and I and I absolutely love it. As soon as you said it, I'm like, "Yes, I'll take my ticket now. Thank you." Um despite what you think of the the sequel trilogy in Star Wars, I do think a lot of people, myself included, believe Adam Driver is one of the highlights of those films. Um and I think to be able to be put among producers as like Kevin Feige and um directed by uh, a Steven Spielberg to be this villain. I mean, he would just knock it out of the park. I mean, I don't really think he's been in a bad role. So you cast Adam Driver in most things, it's going to be great regardless of the quality of the film. Um, he's shown he can be a villain. He can show, he can show, provide emotional depth to a villain. Um, and I would just love to see it uh, paired alongside uh, the other four members of the Fantastic Four that we had previously stated. I am. I'm in. I'm all in. I love your cast. It Thank is you. fantastic. Ha <laughs> ha! Ding ding ding! But before we go into our pitches, I do want to do a brief recap of our picks. Um, so, Pat, please, who are your Fantastic Four and Doctor Doom again? Mister Fantastic, Brian Cranston. Sue Storm, a.k.a. the Invisible Woman, Laura Dern, Johnny Storm, the Human Torch, Nathan Fillion, Ben Grimm, the Thing, is Bob Odenkirk, and Dr. Victor Von Doom is the incomparable Daniel Day-Lewis. Wonderful. And again, to recap my list, my Reed Richards was Joseph Gordon-Levitt, my Sue Storm was Allison Brie, my Johnny Storm was Mike Faced, my Ben Grimm was Seth Rogen, and my Doctor Doom was Adam Driver. Okay, now it's one thing to cast the film, it's another to pitch the film. So Pat, are you ready to pitch your movie? Absolutely. I devoted way too much time of my life over the past <laughs> two days writing a movie that will never get made. I'm ready. Well, <laughs> well hey, I love the commitment, um, but I do have a couple questions before you get into your pitch. Uh, first, is the movie you're pitching an origin film? No, sir. It is not. I probably could have guessed that based on the actors <laughs> you chose, but I don't want to be presumptive, you know? Fair like... enough. <laughs> you don't want to be ageist, okay? No, I do not. That is the last thing this podcast wants to be. Um, my second question is, is your film part of the MCU? I left it intentionally vague. It could be if it wants to be but it very much exists in its own universe at the moment, very much in the same vein as a Logan uh, type of story. Yeah. And, you know, I realize as I ask that, with the multiverse being introduced, all of these films could, in theory, be part of the MCU via the multiverse. Yes. But when I do ask this question going forward and in future episodes, it's going to be part of the MCU proper, not taking into account any multiversal universes. Hey, Dan, guess what? My movie but, features the multiverse. Ooh, tease into the pitch. <laughs> uh, well, you know, before you, you provide any more spoilers, Pat, why don't you pitch us your Fantastic Four movie? For my movie, I really wanted to incorporate a lot of the crazy Jack Kirby cosmic aspects from the comics while honoring one of my favorite comics of all time, which is Jonathan Hickman's run on the Fantastic Four. I really wanted my movie to be a true blockbuster, very big in scale, while also playing off the main theme I had in mind, which is fathers and sons. I want to incorporate Nathaniel Richards, the father of Reed, into my story, who would be played by Steven Spielberg collaborator Tom Hanks. I also want to use the children of Reed and Sue, Franklin and Valeria Richards, with my film featuring young and older versions of the characters. This film will be an epic that takes us into the lives of an older, seasoned version of the Fantastic Four as we explore the character of Reed, who is struggling with legacy, humanity, and the future of mankind in his older age. I want this film to start off with the small scene of a young Reed being mentored by his father Nathaniel, and in the distance we see two figures draped in white watching them that disappear into a white vortex-like portal. This will lead directly into a huge action sequence which thrusts us into the present day of this world where we see the Fantastic Four will be facing off against the Wizard. This scene will be... 
this scene will be used to show how experienced the four heroes are and how well they work together while showcasing their powers. While the team started off as adventurers in this universe, at this point in their lives they are full on superheroes. This scene will also propel the story forward as Reed begins to doubt the future of humanity and attempts to find a way to, as he would put it, solve everything. This would lead Reed to discovering the Council of Reeds, a group of variant Reed Richards who work outside of the multiverse trying to find a way to solve all the problems of the multiverse. Our Reed would begin working with them, but this would cause him to become distant to his family and friends, almost completely shutting them out, and this will give the other three characters and the kids time to really shine and, and voice their complaints to him and really show him that He's not being the best husband slash father slash friend. Before becoming a full-time member, Reed would discover that all of the members of the council have already forsaken their family and friends to only focus on their work. And this would cause our Reed to have a change of heart and reject their membership to be a better husband, father, and friend. While all of this is happening, I plan on flashing back to Reed's upbringing, seeing him having a father who was absent for most of his childhood, while st still being there sometimes to give him nuggets of fatherly advice. Just then, the Council of Reeds would be attacked by Mad Celestials, who discovered the Council by scanning the mind of their universe's Reed Richard, who want to use the Multiversal Bridge to take over other universes in the same way that they took over their own. They lay waste to most of the Council, but are held off, which allows our Reed to make his exit back home. Upon returning, he is greeted by his time-traveling father, who spends time with his son and his family. He warns Reed that the Mad Celestials will find a way into his universe because he knows the future and that Reed needs to prepare for it. This will force Reed to call on aid from his arch enemy, Victor Von Doom, as they work together with the rest of the Fantastic Four and Nathaniel, building a weapon big enough to defeat the Celestials. When the Mad Cosmic Beings arrive in our universe, Reed enacts step one of his plan as he summons the Cosmic Entity Galactus, who kills one of the Celestials but is killed by the combined strength of the three remaining. Reed and Doom fire off the weapon they had built, which damages the remaining three Celestials, but is not enough to defeat them. When all hope is lost, a white light appears coming from the same white portal we saw in the beginning of the film, and it is a future version of Franklin Richards, arriving to save his father, a father that never raised him because he died in this moment in his time. Using his tremendous power, Franklin rises Galactus from the dead and makes him his herald as the two beings defeat the Celestials and Reed watches on, realizing that humanity has hope because one man had saved the entire universe out of love. The movie ends with the team together as Reed is spending time with his son, content with his place in the world. And yes, I went full crazy town on this movie. And I have tons of more notes, but I tried to condense it as much as possible. That was awesome. I really liked your pitch. Uh, a couple questions, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, I threw a lot at you. I threw a lot. <laughs> I tried to make it. I tried to tell a lot in a short amount of time. No, no, that's great. Being that this episode is focused on Steven Spielberg, what about his film and directing style do you see as a fit for this film you're pitching? How do you see him being the right person for this film um, going forward. I I think of Spielberg and I think of, as you said, innovation, blockbuster innovation. He's constantly trying to outdo himself when it comes to, and he's, and he's constantly trying to test the limits of filmmaking. Um, we saw that with Jurassic Park. We saw that with Jaws. We saw that with things, even things that didn't really sit well with people like Ready Player One. He's, he's very willing to try and be extremely ambitious. And I think... For a movie like this, it is essentially the old man Logan of this version of the Fantastic Four. I think so, I think it will really suit his filmmaking style because he has a way of world building. And this film requires someone to really build a world that's already been lived in for a long amount of time by these characters. And kind of create an expansive universe that could be told in a self-contained story that is very much focused on character. And I think someone like Spielberg has the tools in his tool belt to kind of get that done. Awesome. Going forward, I hope all these movies that are going to be pitched, like the one Pat just did and my guests going forward, get made. Will they? No. But it's fun to dream. For my pitch, 
I did not nearly go as um, thorough. Um, yeah, Looney but... Tunes, Crazy Town. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that is not to discourage anyone from doing that. Um, but what I tried to do was look at what Steven Spielberg has done and um, what, he, what he hasn't and where he might want to go as a director. Um, looking at a lot of his films, whether it's E.T., uh, Close Encounters, War of the Worlds, we have a lot of situations where uh, extraterrestrial entities come to Earth, but we don't have a lot where he ventures into space. And I think my film, which a is it is an origin film, but it isn't part of the MCU. It's its own contained story. Um, will be very much um, an exploration, or be heavily featured on at least the mission into space. Um, however, as we build up to that, uh, there's going to be vignettes of each character and how they all kind of found each other before heading off into this mission. So I see the movie starting um, actually in what is probably one of the more famous Marvel covers, Fantastic Four, number one, volume one, um, where they're all fighting um, Mole Man, Giganto, Tricephalus, the rock monsters, um, and you're seeing them utilizing their powers as like um, an intro. So we're getting some action, like what we've seen with like Saving Private Ryan. We're getting some deep fun action right away and then we're going to build into how did we get here um and i see kind of different styles uh for each character being built upon um i see like a kind of minority report aesthetic when we're looking at reed and dr doom and how their bond and ultimate break does dissolving of their relationship happens with a lot of science and technology and very sci-fi heavy with Ben I and focusing on his time on Yancey Street. Um, we've seen a lot of that kind of aesthetic. I don't want to say it's going to be black and white like Schindler's List, but we've seen Spielberg take content like that, that very kind of intimate, um, tough environment and be featured there. And that's what I see with Ben. Um, I see kind of a little more action and lightheartedness with Johnny and Sue and how their growing up takes place. Uh, so kind of these different vignettes on how these characters came to be and ultimately come together. And then we see them take off into space. I see a large chunk of this being their adventure in space, the um, getting hit with the cosmic radiation, returning and dealing with their powers. And then it ultimately ends up leading to... Um, the conflict with Mole Man and the finish of the fight. Um, so no, I'm not diving as heavily into it as Pat did, but that's what I see uh, how Spielberg can kind of take different elements of his filmography and kind of break them into these tiny portions and ultimately come together in this one big science fiction battle. Um, I, I love it. And I love the way you're choosing to tell the story. I can, I can definitely visualize it in my head. And I think we both kind of yearn for a movie that really features the Fantastic Four using their powers, yeah. right? Um, which which we haven't and gotten yet. One thing I didn't do, I like Mole Man. It, like we mentioned earlier, is a classic Fantastic Four villain, um, and I would be remiss not to cast it a little bit. Um, and I think I'd see love to see Mark Rylance as the Mole Man. Oh, that's great! Uh, Oscar-winning performance in Steven Spielberg's Bridge of Spies also featured in Ready Player One. Um, I'd love to see him kind of take on this kind of smarmy kind of villainous role, this underworld dwelling uh, creature. And I think he could kind of pull that off pretty well. Um, so those are our pitches. Any final thoughts on the films we just discussed, Pat? Um, I think I need to go scout for budget because i think my films would cost like a billion dollars <laughs> i think i need to tone it down well i mean if anyone could get it it might be spielberg that's true well there you have it our fan casts and pitches for a steven spielberg helmed fantastic four movie uh they've been completed sorry uh, for blowing you your mind <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> We, we hope you, the listeners, uh, have enjoyed our exploration into this what-if scenario. Okay. Going forward, you can find us on your favorite podcast platform. 
If you're listening to us on YouTube, don't be afraid to hit that subscribe button and also to comment with who your Spielberg fan cast would be, what your thought of our lists are, if you have your own pitch, and which director you want to see appear next on our show. Before we sign off, Pat, I do have one more question for you. Hit me. Since we have not gotten an official MCU cast announcement yet, who would you like to see as the Marvel Cinematic Universe's Fantastic Four? Oh, gosh. Throwing me on the spot here. Um, call me basic, if you will, but I really want to see Krasinski as Mr. Fantastic. I think he would be a very good mid middle-aged uh, to youngish Reed Richards. Um, and if that's the case, give me Emily Blunt as Sue Storm, because why not? She's fantastic. She is amazing. I don't want to say fantastic again, so I squir swerved it, <laughs> but she is just, ugh, I put her in everything. She's great. I want Dacry Montgomery as da Johnny Storm. For our, for our listeners, it's Dacker, but I know Pat's just uh, being I, Pat. I much prefer Dacry. Um, and I would like Liev Schreiber as Ben Grimm. I, I really enjoy him, and I think that he will bring this uh, street-tough attitude to Ben Grimm that, that we are sorely missing. And, of course, I wanted to cast an actor of uh of jewish descent awesome love your choices there's a reason uh krasinski has been going around i think he'd be a fantastic choice as are all of your choices um but with that said that is our show thank you all so much for listening i am your host dan bettenhausen and on behalf of my guest pat Bolfamonte, i hope you all have a fantastic day flame out